Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. This is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Halloween, a tradition or a door? Tomorrow night, trick-or-treaters will be out in droves celebrating the night of darkness, dressed as ghosts and goblins and scary creatures, with some fun costume thrown in as well. Fun costumes like fairies, superheroes, and even some angels for good measure. But is it all fun and games? Is it just a harmless tradition or can Halloween open doors to the darkness? Turn with me please to our scripture today, which is found in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14 through 16. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servants said to him, Behold, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skilled in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So the question that is laid before us today is, is Halloween just a harmless tradition or can it open unwanted spiritual doors? Well, Halloween might be a tradition, but I believe that it's far from harmless. Whenever you dabble in the occult, you open spiritual doors, doors that can be difficult to close, difficult to shut sometimes. Let us back up just a chapter of two and take an example from the life of King Saul. Look with me, please, at 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 47 through 48. When Saul had taken the kingship over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the Ammonites, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, against the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he routed them, and he did valiantly and struck the Amalekites and delivered Israel out of the hands of those who plundered them. When Saul had taken the kingship over Israel, in other words, when he had taken possession of the kingdom, he fought against all of his enemies on every side. He did not side up with them. He did not negotiate with them. He did not make treaties with them. He fought against them. They were not his friends. They were his enemies, and he treated them as such. And it should be the same with us today, now that the kingdom of God has come upon us. We too are to fight against all of our enemies on every side. It is not time for alliances with the enemy. It's time for spiritual warfare on every side. Someone may question, has the kingdom of God really come upon us? I would venture to say, yes, yes, indeed, certainly the kingdom of God has come upon us. It is here now. Jesus ushered it in 2,000 years ago. He even told the Pharisees plainly in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. He said, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Therefore, the kingdom of God is here because Jesus did cast out demons by the Spirit of God. Therefore, the king of God, kingdom of God has come upon you. But please understand, the kingdom of God can only be taken by those who are valiant. That is, those who are courageous, those who are violent in the spirit, those who are spiritually violent. Look with me at Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Jesus cast out evil spirits, and he expects us to do the same. He gave us authority to cast out demonic spirits, heal the sick, and yes, even raise the dead. So yes, that's right, I said it. We should be raising the dead. 
But you know what? There are those in the church who would rather make an alliance with the darkness rather than casting out that darkness. Others would even frown on people who operate in the spirit, in the spiritual. Those who, who, because they enjoy the ways of darkness themselves. They will go as far as to persecute those who do such things like casting out demonic spirits. And these are they, their fellow soldiers, if you can believe that. That, my friend, is called friendly fire. And I would suggest that you just search friendly fire sometime on the internet. The number of troops killed by so-called friendly fire is staggering. Look with me at the end of verse 47 and all of 48. First Samuel chapter 14, 47 through 48. Wherever he turned, he routed them, and he did valiantly, and struck the Malachites, and delivered Israel out of the hands of those who plundered them. King Saul routed his enemies wherever he turned, and in so doing, he delivered Israel out of the hands of their enemies who plundered them. He fought valiantly. He fought bravely, and he struck the enemies continuously. He did not wait for them to regroup. Neither did he throw his law in with them, but he delivered Israel out of, the, out of their hands that they might prosper once again from those who were plundering them because he stopped the plundering. Let me give you one more example. In the book of Numbers, Israel's war, what was warring against Midian, and the Lord commanded Moses to avenge the people of Israel under Midianites. But when Israel went out to fight, they killed the kings, they killed the soldiers, but the women they kept alive, along with their children. They plundered all of the Midianites' goods. And they destroyed and burnt all of their encampments. Then, after the fighting was over, they came back to camp and they brought with them the plunder. Let, let, let us read what happened. Numbers chapter 31 verse 12. Then they brought the captives and the plunder and the spoil to Moses and to Eleazar the king and to the congregation of the people of Israel at the camp on the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. Notice that the first thing that is listed is the captives. They brought the captives and the plunder to Moses and Eleazar and the congregation of the people of Israel. They brought the things that were devoted to destruction into the congregation of Israel. In other words, they brought the things of darkness into the presence of the Lord their God. Look at what happens next in Numbers chapter 31 verse 14 through 16. And Moses was angry with the officers of the army, the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds, who had come from the service in the war. Moses said to them, Have you let all the women live? Behold, these, on Balaam's advice, caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And so the plan came upon the congregation of the Lord. The soldiers brought the cursed things into their own territory and into the presence of God, knowing fully well that it was these very things, these very women who had caused Israel to sin against the Lord their God in the first place. This is the same thing that we're doing today when we bring tarot cards, Ouija boards, horoscopes, and yes, even Halloween and its paraphernalia into your homes. We have essentially brought the cursed things into our lives, which opens up spiritual doors, just like Moses told the, the, the soldiers. So, is Halloween a tradition? Uh, yes, yes, Halloween is a tradition, but it's not our tradition. So let's see whose tradition it really is then. Let us look at those, who, those opponents of the gospel and what they think about Halloween. So, first, let us look at Anton LaVey. Anton LaVey was the founder and high priest of the first church of Satan. Let us see what his thoughts are 
on Halloween. I am glad that Christian parents let their children worship the devil at least one night out of the year. Welcome to Halloween, end of quote. He's also credited with saying, and I quote, we think because we are not performing any demonic rituals or human sacrifices that we are on safe ground. But did you know that as soon as you dress up, whether you color yourself or put on a costume, the enemy owns you. Because by doing so, you have turned over your legal rights and you have dedicated yourself and your kids to celebrating the devil's holiday. You have just made a pact with the enemy and you are already sacrificing your children spiritually by dressing them up and changing their identity, end of quote. But does the church of Satan still believe that? Well, let's go and check their website to see what it is. They said on their website, and I quote, We see this holiday as the night when the mundane folk try to reach down inside and touch the darkness, which for Satanists is a daily mode of existence, particularly in the United States, Halloween is a time for celebrating monster films, wearing costumes of a macabre nature, and evoking the thrill of fun fair. The thrill of fun fair. And a macabre nature would be a grotesque, a horrible, a ghastly, grim nature. So let us now take a look. And another witness, John Ramirez. John Ramirez is an ex-Satanist who claims that he was a general in witchcraft. He said that he would sit and talk with the devil just like you and I would sit and talk with each other. Here's what he had to say about Halloween. He said he had demonic wedding on Halloween with animal rituals and blood sacrifices because that is the devil's holiday. He goes on to give five reasons why Christians should not celebrate Halloween. This comes from an ex-Satanist, an ex-witch. One, it gives the devil legal rights to change your identity. Two, eternal mistake because it causes a curse. Three, Satanists celebrate it, so why should we? When we, we bring it into the church, we grieve the Spirit of God. And five, the candles and other stuff are prayed over to bring a curse. And we just posted a video on that. So the link is posted below. Check that out. In other words, it opens demonic doors. Apparently, witches and Wiccans claim that, that Halloween is one of their high holy days. It's time for marriages. It's time for celebration as they celebrate their new year. So... To answer the question, is Halloween a tradition or an open door to demonic activity? I believe without a doubt, celebration by participation in the dark occult practice of Halloween, no matter how innocent we try to make it, will open spiritual doors just like any other occult activity will. If this is the case, then, why would Christians, and even more so, why would Christian pastors choose to celebrate what is seen as a holy night for the dark side? God said this through, through the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearances of evil. It does not have to be evil. It just has to appear as evil. That makes a whole world of difference. That changes everything. Paul was so committed to helping and encouraging people, encouraging his fellow brothers, his fellow sisters, and not being the cause for someone to stumble that he said he would refuse to eat meat if it came down to that. Look at what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Paul 
went as far as saying, if food is a stumbling block for my brother, if food is a stumbling block for my sister, I have enough love in my heart for me not to eat meat ever again. Well, at least not in their presence that they might see. But we have pastors and their wives with huge international platforms posting them celebrating the Devil's Night. And when they're called out on it, they post more pictures and more things about it and make statements like, just to stir the pot. Let me ask you, is that brotherly love? Or is that self-love? I don't believe that they're following the example that Paul left us. No. That is causing your brother to stumble and not caring whether he stumble or not. Just as long as you and your loved ones are happy. Just as long as you and your loved ones are enjoying life. It doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter. If you cause your brother to stumble, you should never do that thing again. Because... We're here for example. We're here to encourage each other. In our scripture about King Saul that we were looking at today, God commanded Saul to smite the Malachites and put everything and everyone to the sword. But Saul refused and saved King Agag and the best of the animals for sacrifice, he claimed. But God was not pleased with what he saw. Samuel said, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. And God took the kingdom and the kingship out of Saul's hand because he saw it as rebellion. Now, if that's the case, when animal sacrifices were acceptable to God, how much more will he be displeased with those who trample the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, underfoot? So don't presume to say, oh, Brother Kenny, that's in the Old Testament. I'm telling you, someone will have to answer to God for that great presumption. Look at what Samuel said in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Presumption is as iniquity and as idolatry. Because of rebellion, God rejected Saul as being king over Israel. After God rejected Saul, an evil spirit, a tormenting evil spirit came upon him. I want, I want to explain it this way. Every one of us, each person, is a house. And that house must be filled at all times. It cannot remain empty. Something must be. Fill it because the house was built or created to be filled. So if we are not filled with the Holy Spirit, then we will be filled with something else. If we have rejected Jesus by our actions and the Holy Spirit becomes less and less in us, guess what becomes more and more in us? You're absolutely right because the house must remain filled. When Saul rebelled against God through disobedience, God rejected King Saul and a tormented spirit came upon him. The rejection left a vacancy and that vacancy had to be filled. It, it, it had to be filled with something. And how should I say that something was unwanted. The only way to get relief was for David, a man after God's own heart, a man of prayer, a man of worship, a man who knew how to seek the Lord, his God, and how to play and sing. In other words, David knew how to worship, and the tormented spirit would leave when, King David, when David worshiped. Therefore, fill the house with good things, or the house will be filled for you, and I can guarantee that the result will not be to your liking. So the conclusion of the matter is this. No, Halloween is not a harmless tradition. It is an open door to the spirit world that can lead to, lead you or, or, or someone that you love your descendants into walking in the ways of darkness. So I wanna ask you this. 
Have you rejected God by your actions and you didn't even realize it? Have you made an alliance with the dark side by your choices? Or maybe you have committed the sin of presumption, which is as a sin of iniquity and idolatry. Because for some reason we kind of overlook the sin of presumption. The bottom line is, do you know Jesus at all? Do you know him as Lord and Savior? I want you to know this. You cannot inherit life without Jesus. If you reject him, he will reject you. If he rejects you, you have no life. Eternal life is only through Jesus. So would you like to know him today? If you would, here's how. All you have to do is to say this prayer with me and believe it with your heart. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry for the sin of presumption. I'm sorry for sinning and rebelling against you. Help me to live for you. I accept your free gift of life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get yourself a Bible and read your Bible every day. Get a highlighter. Highlight the verses that are meaningful to you, the promises that you can stand on. Find yourself a Bible believing church. Stay away from those progressive churches and find yourself a Bible believing church that believes there's a right way and a wrong way. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you. The Lord bless you. I'm Kenny Yates. Be blessed and stay blessed.